So the solution was using moving bed biofilm reactor. This was like plastic uh, things added to the, in order to save space. So they were added and then they act as biofilms where bacteria can use aer aeration in order to uh, remove the sludge and the water at the end of these uh, septic tanks will, was used in irrigation. This is so our recommendation as used is for, for everybody in Indonesia and in Lebanon and it can be used everywhere is to take the initiatives and do projects in your school, in your university, in the, in the street you are living in and then go on a municipality level in order to work, it can be made in, any, in many other places. Also, it's, it's unreal or unfair to go and work without knowing what type of geology do you have or without knowing what, what has been done in your area to build on. So uh, do research or be part of research or read research that, that's about water and about the projects that you are working on. And in the MACM, we believe that education is the key and that's what we concentrate on. So uh, you uh, shall be engaged in watch programs because even if you have fresh water and you are not manage managing it properly or putting sewages uh, inside rivers or inside seas or even if like kids are not trained on how to wash uh, themselves or how to clean themselves or how to use water. So uh, this won't help and all of the fresh water that you have won't be uh, used properly or won't be effective or efficient for you. So uh, engage in wash programs in schools and thank you for listening. So, yeah. Hello, you know, from my side, I'm Jika from Central East Europe. That's why I'm from Slovenia. And we are a youth water community in Central East Europe. And I will show you what we did in the last one year and a half of our existence. So, who we are? Firstly, I want to say that we were established after the summer school, which the GWP, Global Water Partnership, Central East Europe, uh, did it in Warsaw in 2017. And after it, we established this community because we saw that there is some leak of uh, youth uh, involvement in policy making decisions, and we tried to do some projects and to do our mission and vision. So it is uh, empowering to motivate youth, then is to advocate them and uh, to be as a stakeholder in the local, national and international policy making processes. Uh, then we have this hashtag act, it's like to support and to Im implement youth lead uh, projects. And our uh, like main keyword is together. So together we can stand and do things uh, that they can do. And our draft vision is to mobilize youth in the region and provide them essential support and policy. This is our first project I will tell about something to you. It's uh, Youth Voices, Policy Choices. It was, uh, it's a project uh, uh, between the uh, uh, Global Water Partnership between Secretariat for Water and Solid Europe and uh, Central East Europe uh, uh, community. Um, so, the partners anonymously acknowledge that the young people have a key role to play in environmental issues as, the, as they can be as, as, as stand as a credible and valuable stakeholders in shaping tomorrow's policies. So, we made the survey and we divide the survey into four different uh, main parts. We try to acknowledge 
the participant profile, what is their seeing in the environmental, water and climate change awareness, what is their awareness about the sustainable development goals, and what is the youth involvement in environment and water policy decisions in their country as they see it. The survey method was distributed electronically via social media platforms through our networks. Um, and as you can see, the, uh, firstly we want to see the profile of the, uh, the, of the people. And as you can see, it's almost 50% uh, of them were complete master's degree or PhD. 25% of them have partly committed to Masters of PhD and we have 15% of bachelor's degree and so on. 88.4% of them of the participants describe their career path as related to the field and in uh, environmental or, uh, water or climate. Oh, it shouldn't be. Anyway, uh, we don't have so much time yet. Uh, there are some, uh, it is a, uh, from previous PowerPoint that we collect all of the, uh, all of the data we gain from this uh, survey. And I would like to kindly ask if, you're, uh, if you want to have this uh, survey answers, just contact us and we'll provide you the PowerPoint because I really don't have the, so much time that we'll go through it. Fish Me Ishme. it's our first project and it was happening in December 2017. Our community organized a workshop which attends students from three different universities in Tirana, Albania. And it was a project that we want to main goal, it was the overview of the situation of the fish of the Ishmi River that goes uh, near Tirana, the main uh, city of, uh, of uh, Albania, and it's quite bad polluted with plastic and other, other things. So what we try to do, we, we, we went there and we organized the workshop for the students so, so, uh, so we collect that the volunteers that lately went on the field, and they try to, uh, they try to um, um, uh, talk with the locals and to knowledge what 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 is their view on it and uh, how they see it. Uh, in, uh, and, so the, the next step of uh, this project, Fish Me Ishwi, that we are seeing, we want to make a drone mapping of it so that we can estimate the amount of the plastic pollution and the amount of the money we would need to clean it up. It's a third hour project. Uh, together we sink, not sink. It's a pilot transboundary project between the Macedonia and uh, uh, Bulgaria, and it is on the transboundary river. So, the project activities would be again an educational workshop for the youth, awareness raising campaign on the field, cleaning the river beds and removing the plastic trash from it, training activities, and cultural transborder event. So we focused on educating, recycling, fostering active collaboration with two transborder communities. So I was kindly asked to do some recommendations for the decision makers. But when I was thinking about, I just thought, ah, why? I will do it for youth and decision makers because we need to shake hands and do it together. So for the youth, I will say, act and be active. On the other hand, for decision makers, I will say, observe 
and be open-minded to what you are trying to do and what they are saying. So I see it as the same thing. And the second one, for the youth, don't be shy. Try to be heard. Try to do some things. Try to show your cases. And for decision makers, for the same thing, can be be aware of what youth can gain from uh, what you can gain from youth. So again, can you help? And thank you. So. Thank you so much, Sia. Uh, we have exactly five minutes for questions, if you have any. Perfect. I saw you. Hi. Um, my name is Haji from Indonesia. Thank you for all your presentations. I have a question for Kerry, actually. So we heard from mostly all of the speakers that the youth need to be proactive. But this is let's say easier if you are from a university setting, you have education and your family um, has the opportunity to access the internet and so on. But with your case, with the indigenous communities, how did you make them be proactive like that? And they made the presentations and they did the social research was the problem. Were they like that proactive or did you do something step by step? Thank you. Okay, so thank you for your question. We'll take this question and then we'll respond to them together. Go ahead. So, a question to Alexander. You are telling about breaking the habits. And I'm wondering, do you have an experience with breaking habits that are really deeply into culture and religion? Any other uh, questions? Okay, so here I am then. That's a great question, thank you. Um, it's interesting because a lot of these youth don't have a lot of spaces to, um, or might not see a lot of spaces to be proactive. And for us, a lot of the youth participation came from the communities. So a lot of their um, elders and parents and teachers are already actively involved in the research partnership, and they wanted to see their youth empowered. Many of the youth don't believe in themselves. Um, they don't have a lot of opportunities where they live. Um, many of them are um, quite poor and involved in subsistence living, and their communities are very interested in empowering their youth. And so many of them have a story of saying, my teacher came to me and said, my dad came to me and said, my um, auntie came to me and said, do you want to join this project? And I thought, no, that's not for me. Um, and with the encouragement of their community members, they participated. And so when the youth um, were part of the project, each of them had a mentor in their community, an elder, a parent, an auntie, a teacher, who supported them through this process. And I think now they're feeling like, wow, I did something I never could have done before. So um, I feel like that's a call to us. Um, well, I'm semi-young. <laughs> All of us who are a little bit older, um, to think about those youth who require sort of that uplifting and that support in order to participate, that we can participate with them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carrie. I would just like to take this opportunity to announce that the organizers have given us 10 additional minutes for our questions and answer. So take this time to reflect on your additional questions before Alexandra comes up. Thank you for your question. Um, so I guess I don't know my answer because obviously I have not a telepathic link to them to answer that. Um, but I don't think it's a cultural question. It's more, it seemed from what I understood by talking with them that it was more about the um, diaries and the sound managers and who are working on this. It's more recent activities in the past uh, well, years, like I mean, a hundred years something, I don't know if it's more or less, but I think it's more like some economical activity that um, well, began to grow. At first, it was manageable, it was okay to work a certain way. And again, I know in most countries, when you operate on an industrial level, uh, you have waste, you have to do something with it. And then there are regulations, there are other things, and people who are involved, you have uh, in time a, a waste management system that has to be put in place. And if that's not the case, uh, it's complicated to manage when you want to develop the kind of activity. 
So I think it's more like how we can manage this to work together and to have both an activity that works and economic growth, but at the same time not have it detrimental to the environment. I don't think it's linked to the culture. So it's more like how can we make sure that this changes? And in that part, what it told me is that they would need the state to kick in and to provide the services and the regulation in place to change them. Thank you, Alessandro. I recognize that we have some partners here. What we would like to thank you so much for supporting this session. I see the representative of the International Sector for Water, I see ACP, and of course, I see our youth partners and to TWP. So thank you so much for coming out. And uh, that was my personal announcement before I start asking for additional questions. Anyone else? Yes. Hello, I have a little question to the speaker from Brazil. Sorry, didn't register your name. Uh, you have Miguel. Miguel. Uh, so, you have mentioned a few really good practical examples of tackling the negative effects of climate change in specific areas. But is there um, um, a, like a movement to Push for like a more holistic approach to create a national, nationwide uh, climate adaptation strategy, or at least a regional adaptation climate adaptation strategy. In that case, not to deal with each individual case, like on a case case basis, but uh, have a like a more uh, integrated approach to that. Thank you, Miguel is from Mexico. Any other questions? <laughs> And I have the, a question about Canada because it's hard, um, if I understood correctly, there have been cases where indigenous knowledge has been taken into account uh, in local or regional decision making. If you could provide any examples of what kind of specific indigenous knowledge was uh, taken into account and how that uh, was, how to say, uh, what it led to, like what new line uh, appeared on the you know, uh, on the protocol, for example, something like that. Thank you. Okay, so I hand over to Miguel and then Carrie. Thank you for the question. I believe I'm living in Brazil, in Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> uh, good question, by the way. Uh, I actually was present in my case story, which is a really important approach. But uh, since I was really interested to take this approach, because I was working before with the National Water Commission in Mexico, so we had like more like really national strategies. But I could realize that sometimes it's also really nice to look in different ways in order to actually make actual action with the means. So that's why I can present that. But uh, in the organization, we have like lots of people working like with more reading and like projects as well. So it wasn't like just like a case story specifically, but for sure like there are more people who are looking at the water issues in more like regional or global uh, point of view as well. So, but I feel like it's also good like to mix different approaches in order to try to come up with more integrated uh, solutions. Yeah. I can give a localized example and then a national example for you. Um, locally, in Canada, as potentially in many of your, your countries, you have national parks, which are preserved spaces. And these are known as spaces for conservation. Um, so, you know, there's no hunting allowed, the, the natural environment is protected, and people can only come as guests and tourists. Um, the problem with this is historically indigenous people have been expelled from the parks and so they've lost access to traditional hunting grounds. And so just last year for the first time in um, Alberta, in Jasper National Park, indigenous people were allowed from that area were allowed to hunt again um, because of their, their feedback and provision of, of their knowledge in that place. There was a bit of public backlash to that, but, but it, it stayed. <laughs> And following that, um, in conjunction with that, have been the creation of a number of national parks that are um, under indigenous jurisdiction. And so 
they manage the parks themselves and manage hunting and fishing in those areas. And that's especially in the territories and the regions that I'm talking about, where Indigenous people have quite a bit more um, influence than they do in the southern provinces. Um, on a bigger level, you might be familiar with the Trans Mountain Pipeline in Canada, which the Canadian government purchased for $4.5 billion last year, um, despite much Indigenous resistance, especially through UNDRA, through the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that Indigenous people hadn't been consulted about how this pipeline would impact their lands. And so our Federal Court of Appeal has overturned permission to build a pipeline at this point. <laughs> there are people still fighting for it, but this is a place where indigenous um, knowledge and rights of the land are definitely um, right up against the, the one of our primary uh, economic sources in Canada, which is the oil industry in this pipeline. But it, it was stopped because of indigenous rights. And, you know, thank Thank you so much, Carrie. Do we have any additional questions? Please. Actually, it's not a question. It's just to say that um, it has been the clearest and the best side event since the beginning of the COVE. I went to like, um, so. <laughs> Because we can see concrete projects. We can see, like, there is a, a really, sorry, I'll say, <laughs> uh, we can really see that young people are really, really um, involved into climate change because this is our future, this is our planet, and this is, we want to really fight for it. And so I just want to say this, and I'm so proud to see your community, this, I love this our association and I'm part of the Youth Voices Policy Choices and we are just amazed to see that all of the young people are reunited and we can all fight to preserve our planet. That's it. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> so I take this opportunity to, of course, uh, thank the, the Office of the President's uh, Special Envoy on Climate Change in Indonesia for organizing this event with uh, UNESCO. I also have to recognize one of our panelists who cannot be with us, he's from Chad, and he's a representative of the, the Youth Parliament for Water, who is a major youth partner for, for UNESCO. And I leave the best for last, which are so, which is basically a summary of the key recommendations of the youth that young people want to be involved in decision making processes, and efforts should be made to include more indigenous youth in decision making processes by having specific seats for them on, on councils and on committees. Um, greater support is needed for youth-led research and innovation. And uh, as uh, Julia said, we want to walk hand in hand with the decision makers. So I think at the end of the day, we're calling for intergenerational dialogue between youth and decision makers. Because as you see, you have knowledge that they can present that can advance the, the climate change negotiations as well as provide solutions to our shared agenda. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for all our amazing young speakers and also for the moderator, Nicole, to facilitate the session. And now before uh, we're going, we have a uh, token of appreciation to all the speakers and moderators that were presented by Mr. Nur Adi, the, uh, the Director of Center of Forestry and Environmental Indonesia. Yes, on behalf of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, we would like to give this certificate of appreciation to all the uh, speakers signed by the Minister of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia. Thank you.
So we hear the voice from the youth. Yes. And it is that the Ministry of Environment and Forestry is interested to work more with the youth. In fact, we have some ideas to work on. Good. Yes. Thank you.